Hello, welcome to We Know Nothing, where we know absolutely nothing. And today in book club, we are getting into chapter eight, titled Athens. I looked it over. It looks like a pretty short and sweet chapter. So let's begin. Athens. Several tall buildings had risen from the ruins. Early that evening, Sophie's mother went to visit a friend. As soon as she was out of the house, Sophie went down the garden to the den. There she found a thick package beside the big cookie tin. Sophie tore it open. It was a video cassette. She ran back to the house. A videotape. How on earth did the philosopher know that they had a VCR? And what was on the cassette? Sophie put the cassette into the recorder. A sprawling city appeared on the TV screen. As the camera zoomed in on the Acropolis, Sophie realized that the city must be Athens. She had often seen pictures of the ancient ruins there. It was a live shot. Summer-clad tourists with cameras slung about them were swarming among the ruins. One of them looked as if he was carrying a notice board. There it was again. Didn't it say, Hilda? After a minute or two, there was a close-up of a middle-aged man. He was rather short with a black, well-trimmed beard, and he was wearing a blue beret. He looked into the camera and said, Welcome to Athens, Sophie. As you've probably guessed, I am Alberto Knox. If not, I will just reiterate that the big rabbit is still being pulled from the top hat of the universe. We are standing at the Acropolis. The word means citadel, or more precisely, the city on the hill. People have lived up here since the Stone Age, the reason, naturally, was its unique location. The elevated plateau was easy to defend against marauders. From the Acropolis, there was also an excellent view down to one of the best harbors in the Mediterranean. As the early Athens began to develop on the plain below the plateau, the Acropolis was used as a fortress and sacred shrine. During the first half of the 5th century BC, a bitter war was waged against the Persians, and in 480, the Persian king Xerxes plundered Athens and burned all the old wooden buildings of the Acropolis. A year later, the Persians were defeated, and that was the beginning of the Golden Age of Athens. The Acropolis was rebuilt, prouder and more magnificent than ever, and now purely as a sacred shrine. This was the period when Socrates walked through the streets and squares talking with the Athenians. He could thus have witnessed the rebirth of the Acropolis and watched the constru construction of all the proud buildings we see around us. And what a building site it was. Behind me, you can see the biggest temple, the Parthenon, which means the Virgin's Place. It was built in honor of Athene, the patron goddess of Athens. The huge marble structure does not have a single straight line, all four sides are slightly curved to make the building appear less heavy. In spite of its colossal dimensions, it gives the impression of lightness. In other words, it presents an optical illusion. The columns lean slightly inwards and would form a pyramid 1,500 meters high if they were continued to a point above the temple. The temple contained nothing but a 12-meter-high statue of Athene. The white marble which in those days was painted in vivid colors, was transported here from a mountain 16 kilometers away. Sophie sat with her heart in her mouth. Was this really the philosopher talking to her? She had only seen his profile that one time in the darkness. Could he be the same man who was now standing at the Acropolis in Athens? He began to walk along the length of the temple, and the camera followed him. He walked right to the edge of the terrace and pointed out over the landscape. The camera focused on an old theater which lay just below the plateau of the Acropolis. There you can see the old Dionyso Dionysos, <laughs> Dionysos Theater. Uh, probably not pronouncing that right. Continued the man in the beret. It is probably the very oldest theater in Europe. This is where the greatest tragedies of Oh boy, here we go, pronunciation. The great tragedies of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides were performed during the time of Socrates. I referred earlier to the ill-fated king Oedipus, 
The tragedy about him by (laughs) Sophocles was first performed here. But they also played comedies. The best known writer of comedies was Aristophanes, who also wrote a spiteful comedy about Socrates as the buffoon of Athens. Right at the back, you can see the stone wall, which the actors used as a backdrop. It was called skein or skene, and it is the origin of our word scene. Oh, so skein. <laughs> uh, incidentally, the word theater comes from an old Greek word meaning to see. But we must get back to the philosopher Sophie. We are going around the Parthenon and down through the gateway. The little man walked around the huge temple and passed some smaller temples on his right. Then he began to walk down some steps between several tall columns. When he reached the foot of the Acropolis, he went up a small hill and pointed out towards Athens. The hill we are standing on is called Arapagos. It was here that the Athenian High Court of Justice passed judgment in murder trials. Many hundreds of years later, St. Paul the Apostle stood here and preached about Jesus and Christianity to the Athenians. We shall return to what he said on a later occasion. Down to the left, you can see the remains of the old city square in Athens, the Agora. With the exception of the large temple to Hephaestus, the god of smiths and metalwork, only some blocks of marble are preserved. Let us go down. The next moment he appeared among the ancient ruins. High up beneath the sky, at the top of Sophie's screen, towered the monumental Athene temple on the Acropolis. Her philosophy teacher had seated himself on one of the blocks of marble. He looked into the camera and said, We are sitting in the old agora in Athens. A sorry sight, don't you think? Today, I mean. But once it was surrounded by splendid temples, courts of justice and other public offices, shops, a concert hall, and even a large gymnastics building, all situated around the square, which is a large open space, the whole of European civilization was founded in this modest area. Words such as politics and democracy, economy and history, biology and physics, mathematics and logic, theology and philosophy, ethics and psychology, theory and method, idea and system, date back to the tiny populace whose everyday life centered around this square. This is where Socrates spent so much of his time talking to the people he met. He might have buttonholed a slave bearing a jar of olive oil and asked the unfortunate man a question on philosophy, for Socrates held that a slave had the same common sense as a man of rank. Perhaps he stood in an animated wrangle with one of the citizens, or held a subdued conversation with his young pupil Plato. It is extraordinary to think about. We still speak of Socratic and Platonic philosophy, but actually being Plato or Socrates is quite another matter. Sophie certainly did think it was extraordinary to think about, but she thought it was just as extraordinary the way her philosopher was suddenly talking to her on a video that had been brought to her own secret hideout in the garden by a mysterious dog. The philosopher rose from the block of marble he was sitting on and said quietly, It was actually my intention to leave it at that, Sophie. I wanted to see the Acropolis and the remains of the old Agora in Athens, but I'm not yet sure that you have grasped just how splendid these surroundings once were, so I'm very tempted to go a bit further. It is quite irregular, of course, but I'm sure I can count on it remaining just between the two of us. Oh, well, a a tiny glimpse will suffice anyway. He said no more, but remained standing there for a long time, staring into the camera. While he stood there, several tall buildings had risen from the ruins. As if by magic, all the old buildings were once again standing. Above the skyline, Sophie could see, still, still see, the Acropolis, But now both that and all the buildings down on the square were brand new. They were covered with gold and painted in garnish colors. Gaily dressed people were strolling about the square. Some wore swords, other carried jars on their heads, and one of them had a roll of papyrus under his arm. Then Sophie recognized her philosophy teacher. He was still wearing the blue beret, but now he was dressed in a yellow tunic in the same style as everyone else. He came towards Sophie, looked into the camera, and said, That's better. Now we are in Athens of antiquity, Sophie. I wanted you to come here in person, you see. 
We are in the year 402 BC, only three years before Socrates dies. I hope you appreciate this exclusive visit because it was very difficult to hire a video camera. <laughs> Sophie felt dizzy. How could this weird man suddenly be in Athens 2,400 years ago? How could she be seeing a video film of a totally different age? There was no videos in antiquity, so could this be a movie? But all the marble buildings looked real. If they had recreated all the old square in Athens as well as the Acropolis just for the sake of a film, the sets would have cost a fortune. At any rate, it would be a colossal price to pay just to teach Sophie about Athens. The man in the beret looked up at her again. Do you see those two men over there, under the colonnade? Sophie noticed an elderly man in a crumpled tunic. He had a long, unkept beard, a snub nose, eyes like gimlets, and chubby cheeks. Beside him stood a handsome young man. That is Socrates and his young pupil Plato. You are going to meet them personally. The philosopher went over to the two men, took off his beret, and said something which Sophie did not understand. It must have been in Greek. Then he looked into the camera and said, I told them you are you were a Norwegian girl who would very much like to meet them. So now Plato will give you some questions to think about, but we must do it quickly before the guards discover us. Sophie felt the blood pounding in her temples as the young man stepped forward and looked into the camera. Welcome to Athens, Sophie, he said in a gentle voice. He spoke with an accent. My name is Plato. I'm going to give you four tasks. First, you must think over how a baker can bake 50 absolutely identical cookies. Then you can ask yourself why all horses, why all horses are the same. Next, you must decide whether you think that man has an immortal soul. And finally, you must say whether men and women are equally sensible. Good luck. Then the picture on the TV screen disappeared. Sophie wound and rewound the tape, but she had seen all that there was. Sophie tried to think things through clearly, but as soon as she thought one thought, another one crowded in before she had thought the first one to its end. She had known from the start that her philosophy teacher was eccentric, but when he started to use teaching methods that defied all laws of nature, Sophie thought he was going too far. Had she really seen Socrates and Plato on TV? Of course not. That was impossible. But it definitely wasn't a cartoon. Sophie took the cassette out of the video recorder and ran up to her room with it. She put it on the top shelf with all the Lego blocks. Then she sank onto the bed, exhausted, and fell asleep. Some hours later, her mother came into the room. She shook Sophie gently and said, What's the matter, Sophie? Mm, you've gone to sleep with all your clothes on. Sophie blinked her eyes sleepily. I've been to Athens, she mumbled. That was all she could manage to say as she turned over and went back to sleep. So that was the end of Chapter 8, Athens. Like I said, short and sweet. We are kind of just getting a little bit of a glimpse into the city of Athens. Now, it's taking an interesting turn, kind of mystical almost, where, you know, the, the TV showed... 2400 years ago Plato and Socrates and Athens and all of its glory um, when if you think about it in today's terms it's really not necessarily possible although anything I think is possible but it makes you wonder like what what is happening there you know how how is that happening where um, the teacher Alberto Knox the philosopher has this has this video where it's like all right we're going back in time let's go back to Athens like interesting um, I'm curious to see if if that is in this book like a real thing where he did travel back in time I, we will find out later I hope <laughs> um, but yeah getting getting to the questions the philosophical questions let's go back here so how can a baker bake 50 absolutely identical cookies is anything truly identical? Because <laughs> now it's making me think really hard about identical. Like, let's take, for instance, identical twins. Are they absolutely 100% without a doubt identical? Because I feel like, I feel like identical is almost impossible, but anything's possible. Oh my gosh, I don't know. <laughs> that really, that really messes with the brain. And then why all horses are the same? Well, we could say that 
you know, not necessarily identical because every horse looks different in some kind of way, but they are the same in the sense that they are a horse. Just like a dog is a dog, a cat is a cat, a human being is a human being. But at the same time, we are so much more than just a label of, let's say, a horse. So a horse is more than just a horse. It's an energetic field. It's it's atoms. It's like, you know, it's made up of so many things rather than just a horse. But at the same time, can a horse be a dog? Mm, probably not. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Okay. What's the next question here? Uh, let's see whether you think a man has an immortal soul. Okay. Personally, I think that human being, I, th mm. well, now we're getting to the question, human beings versus animals versus plants versus literally everything is a soul strictly for a human being. Do you even believe in the soul and is it immortal? Will it last forever? Hmm. I mean, I think energy is recycled. I think if we have a soul, I think it can be recycled. And so in a way it can last forever, but I don't know. What do you think about that? And finally, let's see here. You must say whether men and women are equally sensible. Well, <laughs> um, I mean, a lot of people can argue that till they're blue in the face. Uh, equally sensible. Well, let's define that. What is equally sensible? I don't know. It's kind of your own perception of it, what you think sensible even means. When I think of sensible, I think of someone who mm, has decent morals, you know, who doesn't go out and murder people. They're pretty sensible in the way that they're they're kind of peaceful and, you know, they're not being quote crazy so let's say like they're they're driving around and they're not like you know swerving everywhere and being wild for me I feel like it's sensible to just kind of be a peaceful person but that's my own that's my own definition of it what do you think sensible is and men and women I mean you know we're, I feel like we all are connected but we are different in many ways and then you get into the topic of you know sexism and all that so i don't know if i'm gonna even touch on that let me know in the comments what you think are men and women equally sensible what is your definition of sensible <laughs> um but yeah so that was an interesting chapter we shall see if uh he really did travel back in time um i mean obviously you know this is kind of a fictional book but it talks a lot about historical figures so it's got history in it but it's also fiction and you know but it's fun. It's fun to read for sure. So next chapter I will just say is Plato. So I'm very excited for Plato. So please stay tuned for that chapter. Um, anyways, what, a, what an interesting little chapter here. Wouldn't it be fun to travel back in time? I feel like it, if, if there were no consequences, if you can go whenever and wherever you wanted to, well, even though time is an illusion, <laughs> but if you could, where would you go? Because I think it would be a fun time if you could just go and observe things, maybe even interact, but have no consequences. That'd be great. So anyways, thank you so much for joining in this chapter. I hope you have a wonderful day.